when I first went to stay with a John Fuang and read a John Lee's instructions on thinking of the breath energy going through the nerves around the muscles of the body, through the different parts of the torso. I didn't realize it, but part of me thought of it as kind of like a make-believe. Until one day I was sitting meditating and noticed that there was some something strange with the breath in my back, or what seemed to be breath in my back. So I changed it, and then I had a lot of movement around in my intestines, and I belched. I saw the connection. Oh, it really is connected. The sensations in the breath, breath sensations in the nerves, and movement of breath through the body. So I went down that evening and mentioned to a John Fuang, oh, this really is true, this breath in the body, breath in the nerves. He looked at me and it looked like he was insulted. I said, of course it's true, which made me reflect. My ideas about what was going on in my body, what was really going on in my body, or maybe just one way of relating to the body. Maybe there were other ways of relating that were just as true, and maybe even more useful. Because after all, when you think of the breath energy flowing through the nerves, once the breath starts getting comfortable, you can think of it going down through the nerves. And when you have that assumption that it's all connected, it makes it easier for this to happen. So we have to question our perceptions, even about our own bodies, perceptions about our feelings. There's an of courseness to them. This is the way they've been all along. This is the way we've interpreted them all along, and it's worked perfectly fine. But for the purpose of gaining some detachment from the body and detachment from our feelings, physical feelings, maybe we need other perceptions. Maybe that means we have to go back and look at what seems to be just the raw experience of having a body sitting here or the raw experience of feelings, maybe there are some perceptions in there that we're not noticing. When we think of the word perception, two things come to mind. One is a mental image, a picture, and another is a word, a name you apply to things. But there's a third kind of perception, and it's more related to your motor skills or your motor sense of the body. That has to do with certain feelings that go together with your idea of the breath. We'll start with the breath. Ask yourself, when you breathe in, where do you think you have to feel the breath for it to count that the breath is actually coming in? And one way of testing this is noticing the sensations that you have as you breathe in and asking yourself, can you disconnect those sensations? For instance, if there's a feeling that you have to pull the breath up through the nose into the forehead, what happens if you stop making those sensations? Will the breath still come in? Of course it'll come in. What, else, what other parts of the body seem to be pulling it in? See if you can relax those so that they stay in a state of suspended relaxation. Will the breath still come in? Well, yes, it will. You begin to realize okay, your perceptions were, were lying to you. Now, sometimes you can perceive that the breath can be in a way that actually is helpful for creating a sense of well-being in the body. But if you find the way you're perceiving of the breath is creating tension, especially if you feel like you're pulling it in from the nose to the back of the head, and it's going to create a lot of tension in the back of the neck, down in the shoulders. You don't really have to perceive it that way. At first you feel kind of lost. If you don't breathe in the way that you felt you had to, how do you know that you're going to breathe? How can you trust the body to breathe? It'll breathe, don't worry. It breathes perfectly fine at night when you're asleep. And this way you begin to get a sense that even your direct relationship to your own body, which seems to be the most intimate relationship you have, is filtered through these perceptions. 
then you can apply the same insight to your feelings of pain in different parts of the body. Pain does happen in the body, but it doesn't have to make inroads in the mind. And by mind here we don't mean just the point, the part of the mind that's talking about it, it's just our awareness. There's a filter of perceptions between the actual sensation of pain and how it registers in the mind. And that filter is going to determine how you respond to it, what you make of it. For me, one of the real revelations was in that series of Dharma talks that John Mahabhava gave to that woman who was dying of cancer. When he talked about the questions he asked about his pain, he was sitting one night meditating, all of a sudden the pain in the body just got really, really severe. It was as if his whole body was on fire. And so he started asking himself questions about the pain. And one of them was, is the pain the same thing as the body? Now the way we talk about pain among ourselves, we would say, of course not. But how does the mind talk to itself about the pain? You have to remember, our first encounters with pain were back in the days when we didn't have any language. And we related to it in terms of our motor reactions and our beginning perceptions. And a lot of those are still sloshing around in the mind and they have a big influence on how we perceive things and how we relate to the pain. So you know the question, is the pain the same thing as the body, it may seem strange. When you actually look at your experience of the pain, it seems to be that way. And because it seems to have invaded the body. We feel really oppressed by it. Can we perceive it as separate? This is where the Buddha's analysis of the sensations of the body into the four elements becomes useful, the four properties, earth, water, wind, fire, solidity, coolness, energy, warmth. That's your sensation of the body as you feel it from within. The pains are something different. They may be in the same place, but they're, they're different. It's a different sort of thing. Can you see the difference? If you can, then you can just stay with those four elements as your object of focus. Let the pain be on another channel or another frequency. Does the pain have an intention? Is it out to get you? Will the pain spread if you allow it to? Does it, in other words, there is that fear that once a pain happens it's going to spread through the body, unless you tense up around it to stop it. Is that going on? Where is the worst spot of the pain right now, the most intense spot? Usually that's the spot we're trying to run away from, but say, no, I'm not going to run away. Chase it down, and you'll find that it keeps moving. It's like a little bead of mercury. Nowadays, I don't allow kids to play with mercury. Back when I was a kid, if the thermometer broke, they let you play with the mercury for a while. You'd push on, it would go, go around really quickly. And you find that the sharpest spot of the pain, if you actually try to chase it down, is like that. It's not quite what you thought it was. All this should help loosen up your perceptions. The idea, well, the way I perceive the world is the way it is, or the only way it is. There are lots of different true perceptions of the world. Think of all our different sciences. Take a piece of rock. Geology will talk about it in one way. Physics will talk about it another way. Subatomic physics will talk about it another way. Paleontology will talk about it another way. All what they say is true. It's true for different purposes. So what perceptions of the body, what perceptions of pain, are true for the purpose of gaining release, of learning how not to suffer? And you can answer that question only when you first are willing to admit to yourself 
the way I'm perceiving my body may not be the most useful way of perceiving it. And my direct experience of the body, my direct experience of the pain, may not be quite as direct as I thought it was. Because that's a lot of what the meditation is all about. All about the things that are happening that seem very obvious are not that way. There's more going on than you usually see. And you have to be willing to question things, open things up. And precisely what questions will work for you, and which questions will work today and maybe not work tomorrow, that really depends. Because it depends on where you're clinging, where you're craving. And all too often we're not really clear about where we're clinging or where we're craving. The Buddha has that point about your craving being located at a particular point. And it may be on a sensation, and it may be on your perception of the sensation, or maybe about your thoughts about the sensation, or at your evaluation of the sensation. There's a lot going on here. There are many layers. And so a question that may work today for you may not work for somebody else, or may not even work for you tomorrow. So you have to be willing to attack the issue from different directions, to pry out and see exactly what are the perceptions that are happening. This is one of the reasons why we have to get the mind in concentration, so we can get it really still, so we can see the things that are really subtle going on inside. When it's really still, you can see an individual perception arise. You catch it at the moment when it arises, and you can see, oh, as soon as that perception comes, that label I put on the pain, say. It has an impact on the mind. And when you catch it that quickly, then you let it go quickly. And you see what the Buddha said is true. There are some things that as soon as one thing arises, something else will arise together with it. And when the first thing passes away, the other thing will pass away with it. That happens in the mind. And you have the choice to allow that first thing to arise, or not. You can let it go. This is why the Buddha was so insistent that what we're experiencing right now is not just the result of our past actions. It's past actions combined with present actions. And we're so blind to what our present actions are that we tend to do them unskillfully. Even when we're sitting here very quiet, the breath is still, the mind is still. There's a lot going on. Just we're gliding across the surface. We're not probing around and asking questions about how we relate to our bodies, how we relate to our feelings. Now we can do it differently. So look at the way you talk to yourself about things. Look at the way you perceive things. And if you're not sure that you're talking to yourself, there is a layer of commentary going on almost all the time. And sometimes there's commentary on the commentary, and commentary on the commentary on the commentary. And you're not going to see these things unless you get the mind really still and start asking questions. And as I said this afternoon, if you don't see anything happening at all, use, say, one of Ajahn Mahabhu's perceptions or one of Ajahn Lee's perceptions. And see if part of the mind balks and says, well, that's not real, that's just kind of make-believe. Okay, what's real then? It's not like you're dealing with direct experience and they're imposing some weird perception on top of it. You've got your experiences filtered through your perceptions. And the question is, which is more useful and more useful for what purpose?
One of the reasons this is a training is because people have gone before us have found that certain perceptions, certain ways of talking to yourself will really make a difference in heading in the right direction. So maybe your perceptions are true, but other perceptions can also be true. Your perceptions may be true for some purposes, but you want to try on the perceptions that are useful for getting the mind free. So look. Ask questions. Use your ingenuity. That's the only way you learn.